Now, I first learned of this project um, from a Time Life series book on aviation from a single picture of the two-seater that you'll see at the end. And this, um, back in 1956, Goodyear was approached by the Army to see if they could develop a fully inflatable airplane that could easily be dropped behind enemy lines so a downed pilot could inflate it and fly out. And Goodyear said, okay, we'll try it. And guess what? They didn't have a prototype fly in two years or a year or six months. Their original first prototype was in the air in 13 weeks. And everything you're seeing here, all this technology to be able to make inflatable airfoils had to be developed in those 13 weeks. And that was like right there, maybe your third or fourth generation. And they were getting better and better. And now this next one had the mono skid, which allowed it to operate on water. And this was an incredible little flyer. And because you're flying in essence in a giant airbag, you could probably make it almost crash survivable. And the thing would be very hard to damage no matter how hard you landed because it's, it's, like it's like a rubber raft as opposed to an airplane. Um, and the army, were, it went, in the army, there's a little compressor on the engine. So in, in military use, you could have like 20, 20 millimeter bullet holes in this. And the little compressor on the engine would keep the thing flying. And I always thought, man, why didn't someone mount, capitalize on this? Can you imagine a luxury yachting market if you could make these two-man versions that you could carry uh, on, you know, in a, in a fiberglass cylinder on the railing of your yacht? So when you drop anchor somewhere, you could island hop in your little inflatable airplane? I mean, I, I think this just was an idea. Now, yeah, there's your two-man version right there. Um, and I don't know, also for years, people have tried to make airplanes, that, I mean, cars that can fly, but the wings were always a problem. But what if you made a car that had wings that were inflated, and that way when you were driving on the road, they were sucked inside, you never knew they were there. One of these, the GA-33, ranks among the most novel aircraft ever constructed. With its conventional shape, it was similar to any other light airplane, except that it was comprised almost entirely of rubberized material. The main fuselage was covered with nothing more than the material fabricated for Goodyear's airship. But the wings and tail needed to be much more rigid if it was to function like a normal plane. What researchers came up with... That was the first model after 13 a weeks. technology known as AirMap. The rigidity of this futuristic material was amazing and proved itself more than adequate to keep a light one-man airplane aloft. As with all the normal control surfaces found on any other light plane, it did need some additional bracing to support its weaker surfaces. Nevertheless, it was a solid piece of engineering. Goodyear designed and built the inflatable plane in just over 12 weeks. They hoped to fill the military's need for a portable observation aircraft, although other ideas were also in the works. Incredibly, the inflatable plane didn't need a great amount of air pressure to fill it up. In fact, Goodyear claimed that the entire aircraft took in less air than the average car tire. The secret behind the success of the GA-33 was its air mass fabric. In it, Goodyear had perfected a material that bonded the two outer surfaces together with a weave of flexible nylon fabric. The nylon pre-stressed the low in just a few weeks and reduced the material's flexibility, making it inflatable and solid. The air mat could become extraordinarily rigid, yet when the cells were deflated, it folded up just like any other rubber material. Goodyear foresaw numerous uses for their concoction, and as the years passed, they perfected various methods of forming air mass so that it could be shaped more finely to form pointed contours. The aerodynamic advantages of this finally enabled the inflatable airplane to get off the ground.
In the fall of 1952, GA-33, the world's first powered inflator plane, was ready for its first flight test. And with test pilot Dick Ulm in the open cockpit, GA-33 rose into the air. After a few short laps, the inflator plane made a perfect landing. The air was released, and it was returned to its compact deflated form. Goodyear had described the GA-33 as a crude design simply built and meant to demonstrate the practicality of an inflatable aircraft. Ohm said that it behaved very similarly to any conventional light plane, but without any protection from the elements, it must have been a pretty bone-chilling experience. all around you shapes the very
packaging design was almost as crucial as the aircraft itself. In combat, pilots might not have access to mechanics or any other kind of support. So everything that the aircraft needed to get aloft and to stay aloft had to be included in the kit. unfolded the wing so that the compressed air could be easily and quickly pumped in. Next, he removed everything from the plane's mobile storage pouch. It was also envisioned that these small rubber planes could rescue downed pilots, even dropping by parachute from other aircraft in the course of their mission. out in the same way as he did the wing. It was a straightforward operation, and no time was wasted in smoothing out creases in the fit. After this, he placed the engine about where he expected it to be in the aircraft's assembled form. A bottle of carbon dioxide was provided to speed up the process. After that, a pump on the engine took over the rest of the job. Once the plane was airborne, this pump constantly topped off the air pressure, keeping it steady throughout the flight. gas to its work. It only took five or ten minutes before the folded mass of rubber became an operational aircraft. The pilot's next job wasn't quite so bizarre. Like any flyer, he carried out his pre-flight safety check, making sure that all systems were good to go. Control surfaces were closely checked to make sure they were intact. Working alone, the pilot took a securing rope and fixed it to a stable point on the ground. This ensured that when the motor was started, the plane didn't run off without it. Second in Plato Plane, the GA-447, so intrigued Army and Navy officials that they placed orders for 10 additional models, just to further explore the potential of this unique aircraft.
engineers had even greater dreams for their inflator plane. Not only did they envision a two-seater version, but also a vertical takeoff model that would actually lift a man out of dense jungle. And it didn't end there because even larger versions were proposed. Inflatable gliders with rescue bomber crews stranded on ice or at sea. Drawings were even made up for a rocket-powered version. But as with many dreams, it just never came true. The two-seater, primarily considered a rescue vehicle, would be the last of the inflator plane experiments. The program went forward for several years, but in spite of the fact that there were only two accidents, neither the Army nor the Navy ever submitted production orders. Knowing that the profits from such a venture would be minimal at best, Goodyear dropped the project. Yeah, if only sharks had lips, I don't think they'd be nearly so scary. More like a friendly dolphin. <laughs>